Excited to uh, be able to sit here on the stage with Mike Richter. Um, for those, how many of you are hockey fans? Legit hockey fans, watch hockey, okay. Legit hockey fans, uh, not the fair weather ones. Um, well, for those who are not familiar with Mike Richter, Mike has a pretty amazing career. Um, started playing hockey um, at UW-Madison. Um, we got some Wisconsin people in the room, right? I know we have somebody from Platteville was on the panel earlier this morning, there we go. Um, but uh, played goalie for the New York Rangers and from 1989 to 2003. And during that time, he led the team to a Stanley Cup win in 1994. He also played on the US Olympics team, um, winning silver for Team USA in 2002. And during his career, he was a three-time All-Star player and an NHL All-Star Game MVP. Um, but Mike retired um, and instead of just going to play golf and uh, maybe even pursue a career in figure skating, like the movie The Cutting Edge, <laughs> he decided to go back to school. He went to Yale and uh, received a degree in ethics, politics, and economics with a concentration in environmental policy. Was that all the hockey pucks that you took to the head that convinced you to do that? Actually, if you've seen my golf game, you'd recognize why I don't pursue that. Uh, it's not good. <laughs> so, no, it, I mean, the quick answer is um, it was something that always interests me. And uh, understanding also, I mean, as, a, as an athlete, you're in a, uh, a wonderful place, but it's a bit of an artificially create a bubble and uh, when you when that bubble pops which inevitably does and you're young um, you feel like you're very old a lot of your peers could be 18 years old looking at you as an ancient guy but I was 38 um, when I got finished and a little bit tough to make plans because you don't you can't say I'm just going to retire now you, that window will open you jump, you jump through it and it'll close quickly mm -hmm. and uh, I just said when the time's right I'll go back to school finish my undergraduate degree and go on and hopefully in some form of sustainability. Okay, so your current day job is CEO of Brightcore Energy. Um, can you explain to the audience what Brightcore does? Well, there's a, there's a lot of groups out there that do what we do and do it well. Um, we're a small company, a um, little bit north of New York, uh, where we look at buildings, um, all types of buildings in the commercial, industrial, municipal space, and we just try to make them operate better. Uh, we try to find inefficiencies, whether it's a light bulb or um, changing out the HVAC system. Mm -hmm. um, we, we do uh, put in renewables such as solar, uh, battery storage, and our strength really is uh, our ability to underwrite these things in a pretty um, comprehensive and creative manner. The two guys who founded this company I bought in about five years ago were Wall Street uh, structured finance guys, um, actually at Lehman, so don't hold that against them. Um, hmm. And I've never really gotten the solid answer whether they brought that company down or not. No, they, they were, <laughs> they're, they're really uh, bright people. And they recognize that a lot of the log jam here is, is financial. It's very easy for me to knock on the door of K through 12 school and say, gee, wouldn't it be great to have solar? Oh, I'm gonna take your light bulbs out. And you're saying, well, I've got budget constraints and I'd love to do it, but I don't have the time, energy, or money to do it. Um, you know, when it comes to public education, there's, there's bonds and other means of doing it. So we're agnostic whether we supply the capital or not, but we're just, when you think of the infrastructure, uh, energy infrastructure out there, it is endless how much work we have to do to get to where we need to be. So I still want to just kind of go back to how you got into, you know, chose this as, as your, your, your next chapter. Um, where was the motivation for you? The motivation for me, I think, <clears throat> was just a, a general interest. I'm not an engineer by training. I, I, I've always loved science, and you, you just see there's more people every day. There's limited amount of resources, whether that's water or food um, and, or arable soil. So all these things start to make financial sense that you're, you're going to be efficient with them one way or another. Um, it, it, this, I think sometimes the conversation has got politicized or lost in, in whatever the conversation is on greenness, and maybe we'll talk about that in a little bit, but it's just fundamentally, if you can be efficient with these resources, you're probably going to come out on top in terms of mm -hmm. the, you know, uh, in the market. And probably nowhere is that more uh, relevant than energy right now. Um, we had a great conversation with the U of T about resiliency. That's part of what we're talking about. The grid is very fragile. Yep. Um, the demand increases. Uh, I've got an electric car now. Uh, it, it blows me away, you know, how you feel just naked if you don't have a place to plug in. We rely on energy now more than ever. Um, and so we better figure it out quick. Yeah. So I want to get into resiliency in, in a little bit and some other things, but I want to go talk for a minute about your, obviously your sports career. 
Um, last night, Kim Lear talked about you know, in, in intergenerational relationships and teamwork and through a lot of the discussions today in both the K-12 Facilities Forum and higher ed, hmm. um, we're talking about staffing challenges and looking to find, uh, you know, find the right people on teams. The team that you were on that won the Stanley Cup, um, Mark Messier was the captain. It was, you know, I'm from New York, so I, I mean, I remember all the stories and, and, and everything. What made that team special? That's, it's a good question to hear anybody talking. I can't believe we won. It was a special group. But I, I think in order to get through, in our case now, it's 32 um, uh, cities competing for a championship. And it's a bit of a marathon. You go through an 80 game, 82 game schedule, and then you start the playoffs, which could last almost three months. I mean, our, our season started that year uh, with an exhibition game in, in London. And we didn't finish until June 14th of that year, 94. So you better be consistent. You better be good. Um, everybody's trying to do the same thing. Look, the world's a competitive place. Certainly, professional athletics is that. And I think sometimes you go, oh, great, you were, you were able to stop a hockey puck. Therefore, I'm listening to you. Why? Um, but there, <laughs> there are um, aspects of teamwork in particular that, that really do translate. And I think there's kind of consistent... Um, themes that will come up. And I think one of them was that intergenerational thing. And, and, you know, I don't want to get too far ahead of your questions here, but that team in particular found a way to make everybody in the room important. Mm -hmm. And Mark Messe is this kind of a bit of a specimen from Western Canada. He's uh, uh, from um, Edmonton, Alberta. And, you know, this is a guy who didn't get out of bed in the morning as a 12 year old knowing exactly how to lead, he learned it, he, he honed his craft about being a player, but also a leader and it really interests him. And he's this pretty extraordinary captain. And there was one comment I think that illustrates this. We had won the cup and again, it was either full of yourself, you feel great, you're, everything's blowing up, it's a big party. And he said, look, don't forget the stick boy and you know Larry, the guy that helped with our equipment. And he said, they are just as much part of this victory as the top center on this team. And you absolutely have to have that understanding because otherwise people just aren't enfranchised. I mean, why would I sacrifice myself, my personal gain for a larger group if it's just is not gonna be acknowledged ever? Mm -hmm. And hopefully you're professional enough to do that when it's not. But this is human nature, and people want to be part of something bigger than themselves. And it wasn't easy. There's, you, you just run into challenges all year long. Physically, you have to stay healthy. Mentally, there's, there's inevitable skids and um, territory that maybe you know, you're playing better than me, but I'm getting more pressed than you. What do you do with that? Mm -hmm. um, they seem like small things, but they can corrode um, that that very necessary understanding that we're all in this together. And maybe today I don't get acknowledged, but I help out. And in the end, we all end up better than the next. And I, I will say this every time, and I hear this all the time. That was the closest group of people I've ever been around. That was a family. And mm -hmm. that was, I knew, you know, the, 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 the friends, the uncles, the, the family members, we knew when, you know, the backup goalie had a sick child. We cared, and um, you, to foster that is a very important thing. And you know, everybody has to go about it their own way. And a hockey team's its own specific entity, but that team had more character and more support for each other than any organization I've been in. I did, you know, leaving that world, which is artificial, and going to the working world. There were times where I was just shocked. You know, people would take their ball and go home. I got a victory. You guys didn't. Um, you know, the team wins and loses as a group. Yeah. And I think if you can foster that in any way, in any application, you're obviously going to be better off. Yeah. So I, I was listening to a story, uh, Jeremy from, from Ains was telling earlier uh, about how, um, for those in the K-12 group, and Jeremy, if you're in here, we saw a nice story about how there was a bus driver hmm. that couldn't have, you know, say on the job because he basically wasn't getting paid enough. But he found out that he actually had some skills that put him into a custodial job, and now obviously he's trying to find the you know find the qualities in people on the team and that you may not be aware of. Yeah, I heard a story about um, Darren Langdon. Good, good you job. know, yeah. um, can you share that with, with the audience? Kind of a Messier kind of. Yeah. I mean, obviously he was on the team. It's not the same thing, but sure. it's always looking and understanding that people on there's different people on the team that that contribute, and obviously 
Well, 100%, we talked about that intergenerational hazing last night a little bit for those who listened to the uh, opening yeah. uh, keynote. And, uh, you know, you have that a lot in sports and, and grade school through professional. And, uh, and you know, some of it's just fun. Some of it's mean-spirited. Uh, it's all over the map, as people are. But there is this kind of, hey, you have to prove yourself. I think um, someone stood up last night as a boomer was talking about some of the younger generation, and this is the way we did things. And there's always that. And, and maybe rightfully so, you know, you have veterans that had gone through a lot of battles and they're very successful. And you look at somebody who's walking in with a huge contract and you're saying, guys, you know, maybe prove yourself before you tell us how the world works. There's a ton of that, obviously, in sports. You probably have all seen it. Well, there was one time where we were playing that year on, uh, we were in Los Angeles and we we're on this winning streak and everybody's feeling big and full of themselves. And one of our enforcers or tougher guys was injured and couldn't play, so we brought up, um, we were going to bring up the next guy in line in the depth charts in the minors, and he was sick. And we went all the way down to kind of, you know, I guess in baseball it'd be like triple A and whatever's under that, and we bring up this guy named Darren Langdon, he's a real kind of self-described hayseed from, from St. John's, Newfoundland. And everybody loves this kid, funny kid, nice kid, tough kid, but a goofy kid, and there's, you know, he's, he'll be the first to acknowledge. and. When he came up, he was already on a road trip. He didn't have a suit. And we're walking through LAX airport and we're all decked out and everything else. And here comes this guy practically in a pair of overalls. And he just took unlimited heat. <laughs> and uh, we were all laughing. And he was laughing too. I mean, he's, he's a funny kid. But good natured, but you're giving it to him. And um, we all laughed. And, and uh, some guys were kind of on him a little bit more. And, Mark was just kind of standing back, shook his hand, welcome aboard, thanks for the help, great to have you part of the family. Um, not much said, and the next day, as it normally is, you get practice the next morning to play Los Angeles that night. You come to the rink, you get a little skate around, um, you shower up, video, back to the rink to the night. In the time that Darren got out on the ice to do the little skate around with his new teammates, Mark had um, hired a guy to come in, um, it was a brand nude, beautiful suit sitting in the locker. Darren got off the ice. The guy measured him, pinned it up, and it was ready to roll for that night's game. Just sitting in the stall. No big fanfare. But it was all the ribbing and all the crap we had given this kid sort of fell by the wayside. It was a really big statement. You're part of the team. You're part of our family. We need you, and we respect. And this kid, you, you know, if you would seen what he'd come through to get to that point, it, it was a story. So there was an acknowledgement that, you know, we respect you and thank you for your help because we needed the guy at the time. And, you know, to this day, he's a lifelong friend and everything else. But at that moment, he didn't know he was going to play one mm -hmm. shift or yeah. never play again. And Mark kind of said, this is a valuable guy. We can rib him all day long, but do acknowledge that this guy's uh, a part of the puzzle piece. Yeah, that's great. That's a great story. And for you, you were 28th pick in the draft, right? Yeah. So... I mean, you weren't at the top on the top there, but look at the career that you went on to, to have. Well, and I think that's part of it. Uh, you know, I, I have friends now that are in the scouting world, and you guys all have to figure out what your talent is coming up and replacement with the great, you know, resignation. And what's very difficult is to figure out. You can, you know, I'm 5'10". I think my hockey card said 5'11". There's a little lie there. But, you know, just an <laughs> average size guy. And then you, what, what's between my ears? What's in my heart? What, what am I willing to do? How am I willing to improve things? And, you know, uh, your metrics of designing who you're going to hire and who you're not going to hire has to some way have an accounting for that. I, I don't have a clear answer for what it is, but it's always the case. Um, success comes in all shapes, sizes, and personalities, and it's up to you to drill down and find out what is going to make that person tick that's going to do the extra things and buy into what you're trying to accomplish because there's no job that doesn't require a lot of work, and so you better have something in you that drives you. So it's not money that makes teams great? It is not, and, uh, you know, I always found it interesting to watch baseball players. I think maybe it was Barry Bonds or someone say, you know, he was insulted by a $5 million offer, and you know, people jump on that and say, my God, you're playing a little kid's game, and how can you be insulted? But there's a little more going on there. They're saying, I hit 40 home runs last year. This guy hit 25 home runs. I'm about excellence, and I'm about being compensated for it, of course, but just acknowledged. And if someone else is doing a lot of work, and you're doing more work, and 
you're not being acknowledged for, it can cause a lot of trouble. And as mm -hmm. almost obscene as that statement may be, it's more about, it doesn't matter. I mean, there's lots of sociology studies about, it doesn't matter what you're being paid. I'm only happy if I'm getting paid a little bit more if I think I'm more valuable than you. It yeah. could be 10 grand and I want 11, or it could be 10 million and I want 11 million. And I think it's really important to kind of make sure people are acknowledged for where they slot in that lineup. Yeah. So UW-Madison, there's the Mike Richter Award. Yeah. Um, that's pretty pretty awesome to have a, an award for that, that's given out every, yeah. what is it, for, NC, for Division One for goaltending? Division One for goaltending. Uh, goal so it's, it's a position-specific award, and I was called up for that. And uh, the equivalent of a Heisman Trophy in hockey is, is the Hobie Baker Award. And if you read the story about Hobie Baker, he's a prison um, undergrad, and he oh. just had this extraordinary life. He went on to, he was one yep. of the best players ever, and he was a war hero. And, on the stuff and then he ended up dying and they named an award after him. And I, I got called and they said, they want to make an award after, after Mike Richter. And I'm thinking, you know, I am actually still alive. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> do you know you got the right person? Um, and I think part of it was it's the NCAA, it's, it's American. There's been incredible hockey uh, players, goaltenders in particular, Ken Dryden comes to mind from the Montreal Canadiens at Cornell, but he was Canadian. So yeah, they named it after me. It was pretty flattering. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So let's jump into resiliency. So at Brightcore, you focus on organizational and energy resiliency. Yep. So how do, you, how do these two things relate and work best together? Well, I, I think the number one concept is use less. Um, and, and, and again, I really want to emphasize, you know, gone are the days where you're saying, I'm going to try to be a you know, conservationist. It, it, it's, you know, ethically and morally, that's wonderful, but you don't need to say, I'm going to save money on my heating bill. I'm going to turn down a thermostat and put on a sweater. There's better materials out there. There's better um, processes and services and opportunities to improve what you have and save money. It's not easy. It doesn't work everywhere, but there's incredible stories about this, you know, getting to net zero. Um, I stopped by uh, the um, high school in Maryland that went to that and starting to look at the metrics. If you end up experiencing these things, and I think it's one of the reasons that Elon Musk has had so much success. He's a crazy man. He's a brilliant guy. Um, you know, people love him, hate him. But one thing that seemed to resonate with people is that is just not an electric car. That car performs extraordinarily well. So, you know, I had a Prius for years, you know, and getting onto the highway, I'd be like, Oh boy, you know, and you're like, <laughs> <laughs> trying to merge when a truck's going 70 and I-95 in New York, you're just, yikes. This thing, you touch it and it, and it can out, rocket. outperform Ferrari some of them. So where we, where we talk about sustainability and where we talk about even resiliency, but green, nobody knows what these terms really mean and yeah. we generally understand it. But I think you almost want to substitute the word better. Yep. There's better building envelopes, there's better heating systems, there's better transportation options. And that is some of the really interesting things that I think the cutting edge schools and technologies and whatnot are starting to figure out. You know, LED lights are pretty boring, but they're also tunable and they last up to 10,000 hours. I mean, the amount of avoided maintenance that you have on them, the ability to mimic daylight. You have these kids in school and adults in school that are learning, do you want to be in a musty, dark environment that's cold over here and breezy over there and hot over here? When you start changing the building envelope, when you start changing the lighting, it's a better place to live, to learn, to, to exist. Um, I, I mean, a quick story, I, I've got a, it's up in um, the Adirondacks, northern New York, and it's you know, often these things are just seasonal cottages that you shut down. And there was a, a biologist up there I came to know, and he was building a house from scratch. And I knew some of the workers that he had um, hired to do this. And these guys are tough, northern New York guys, chewing tobacco, have a beer, it's 10 below, doesn't matter. I'm going to, you know, put this thing up. I know how to build. And they're, they're good. And I stopped off. He said, oh, you got to look at my house. It's being built. It's going to be... Uh, uh, energy positive. I mean, you know, it, it's going to produce more energy than it actually consumes. Wow, you know, and this is viciously cold in the winter time up uh, up in you know upstate New York, um, right outside the town of Lake Placid. And I went there, and these guys were like, "This guy's a clown." I mean, we know how to put these buildings together, and our walls now are 18 inches thick. He's 
overbuilding this thing. I mean, if he wants to pay us, go ahead. But huh. this professor is not the brightest bulb I've ever seen. And he's kind of disparaging of this extra material that they're putting in. And so I came back about three months later. It's early December. It's snow flurries coming out there. These guys are in T-shirts. The heating system isn't even put in. The windows have gone in. It's quiet as a mouse in there. It's perfect temperature. Their body heat is keeping them warm enough. <laughs> and they're going, this place is extraordinary. Look at this, come over here. Yeah, the depth of this window sill is this. From the outside, it looks like a normal house, just a cedar shake house. On the inside, you walk in and you immediately know something's different. You know, now it's geothermal and they got, he, he went through everything. But <clears throat> those guys had been doing this same type of building for decades. And they were a little skeptical about it, but they walked away going, that's a better building. Yeah. And when the cost curve can start to come down where it's comparable and the operational costs and the avoided maintenance actually are paying you, you really have something there. But I think that, again, that concept of better is crucially important. Better, yeah, and you know, we were discussing this earlier. And again, there's definitely fatigue around sustainability sure. or, or yeah. you know, saving the spotted owl. We yeah, talking absolutely. About, but... I mean, this is about people. This is about better learning environments. This is about saving money. Yeah. Saving money. Exactly right. So, so capital is a concern for, for our audience here, right? I mean, everybody's struggling now absolutely. with, with, uh, with costs. So your organization, of course, can help you know, finance sure. uh, you know, retrofits. But what are some of the pushback you still get, right? Because it still sounds like a great deal. All right, you can come in, we can retrofit, and we can you know, have a financing mechanism to make it work. What, what, is the, what well, are the skeptics, or yeah, how do you, how do you sell I think the skeptics? There's understandable skepticism. People hold their wallets when you start saying, hey, I can finance that. It's like, oh, man, it's not enough to buy this thing, and now you're loading on extra percentage points on, on the financing. We tend to not really make our money in financing. We're trying to just break through the logjam and get these, these building materials and processes in place. Um, the, we're talking off the shelf technology. You know, why isn't every light bulb in this place, and I haven't looked, LED? Why isn't all of our buildings up to the moment with proven technology? It's probably some form of capital hurdle, one way or another. And, you know, we, I've dealt with enough facilities guys. There's not a moment in the day, there's so many just holes to fill and plug, yeah. so it's not like you can just sit there and go, you know, what project can I come up with today? I understand that, but it, it becomes so difficult because of the budgetary constraints, even before COVID, but my gosh, after COVID, even worse for private and public. Um, so yeah, whether we fill that gap in terms of the financing or some form of municipal bond, or there's plenty, we were talking this morning of, of low interest loans from the DOE and all kinds of great places, we can lasso those things, all we care about is structuring this thing so that in the best of circumstances, you can not dip into your pockets for the capital expenses and maybe it becomes an op expense and you're saving money from day one. You know, think about that. That's like me coming up and saying, okay, I'm gonna take a carburetor out of your Hummer and instead of getting eight miles to the gallon, you're getting 80 miles to the gallon. Do you wanna do this? I'll finance the thing so you're saving that gas. This is, it doesn't work everywhere, but it can work in many, many places. And again, this is not like you're the guinea pig. This is off-the-shelf technology. Yeah. And how do we just find at scale to start breaking through that barrier of saying, yeah, I know, I know, I know. I'm in a, uh, you know, a poor area of the Bronx, and I just don't have the capital to start upgrading light bulbs. I got light bulbs. Look, they work. Well, they do, but you're bleeding. You're hemorrhaging cash. So yeah. can we fix these things in a manner that doesn't break your bank and still saves you cash? And the better, more efficient technologies, you can do it. Um, and now there's a lot of movement toward end of useful life. Um, if you're changing that water heater out or changing that HVAC system, don't lock yourself in for 15 to 20 years of greenhouse gas emitting um, uh, you know, uh, technology. Go the next step, and whether it's beneficial electrification, geothermal, whatever it is. Yeah. There's, there's ways of doing it that are going to um, save the environment and save the capital. I picture you, Clarence Carson from Chicago Public Schools was saying that when he comes in, came to the hotel last night, he was looking at the vents because that's, you know, looking, yeah. making sure, thinking about the filters. Do you sure. walk in like, these should be retrofitted? <laughs> <laughs> well, often with the lights, yeah, it's, it's, I have become very boring at most family dinners, but I will say <laughs> this, uh, b more boring, I should say. Um, I think you, you, you hit on something there though. And, and again, I think this intersection 
where you're looking at both the light bulbs and the vents and everything else. Um, I think Jason from Wells here, you know, we're starting to make the connection more and more. It's, this is about people and this is about health and performance, performance of the building and performance yep. of the people that occupy these buildings. And it makes a huge, huge uh, kind of, I don't know, leap in your mind that this is actually going to benefit your own performance. And you're starting to see that now with COVID, how many air exchanges and everything else. If you wrap that building, you can start having, you know, an unhealthy air quality inside even more so than the leaky buildings have. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's, I think people are starting to get a better understanding of this, but in the end, if your air quality is better, your comfort level in terms of the, 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 the temperature and, and humidity level, light level, this is all about human comfort and human performance and human health. Yeah. Well, there's definitely a big connection there. And I think that the pandemic is now really sh shine a light on the healthy building movement. So I know tomorrow we'll have a talk from the International Well-Building Institute. And, and I'm looking forward to that because, I, I mean, when I got done playing hockey, again, this kind of artificial world, I, I joined a fair number of NGO boards and whatnot. And I had a person come up to me. Um, I was on the Riverkeeper board, cleaning up the Hudson River in New York, where we lived in the Upper West Side. So, you, you know, you're an unlikely environmentalists and I said you know am I like what does an environmentalist look like um, and uh, they're saying well you know a professional athlete that's not typical but you know, think about it right um, I've never met anybody that's been serious about their athletic career that isn't pretty anal about how they eat when they sleep how they recover how they hydrate why because how you the environment in which you live and, and breathe and consume is going to affect your health. And your health always perfect, yeah. uh, affects your performance. I had a coach that once said, you know, you have a Ferrari. Your, 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 your body is your Ferrari. That's your performance vehicle. Why would you ever go to a gas station to fill it up with muddy gasoline and expect it to perform well? Yeah. And it's a pretty good analogy. Why do we expect the best out of ourselves when we're not putting ourselves in an environment for this? So... Um, you know, Phil Knight had this great statement. He wanted to sell shoes. He said, you know, if you, if you breathe or if you, if you walk, you're an athlete. You should have shoes. You should walk. And I think if you breathe, you're an environmentalist. I mean, is that a political statement where left, right, or in between? You want your kids to have fresh water, fresh air? Uh, how you go about it can differ. We can yeah. all argue about it. But I think it's pretty common understanding that that's a, a positive for humans. So I was just going to go on that because Lori and uh, Zico from CUNY just yeah. gave a talk about how they use their athletic yeah. training and how they apply that in the workplace. Are there any specific things, now you understand what you know, audience specifically within facilities do, that you, lessons that you've taken from your professional sports career that you apply to business or more specifically that you think could be applied to facilities management? Yeah, I think the statement last night again was, um, you know, understand how to lose. Okay, um, you know, we always talk, I've got three young boys, you gotta teach them how to win. That's we're right, pretty, we lose 90% of the time. pretty good at winning, yeah. you know, you, you wave and say, I did this. Uh, how do you lose, what do you take from it? And these are things that can be seared into your memory, whether it's an athletic thing or a test you just did poorly on in eighth grade. Um, Maybe you didn't prepare well. Maybe you, you, you prepared very well, but it was the wrong material. What is it? Are you learning from these things? Are you growing? Are you, because these are, you know, it sounds petty, but they're teachable moments. And I, I just think there's a, a little bit of um, a misconception. Um, there are two sides of the same coin. Uh, we don't win in life as much as we probably lose. And so you better get some value out of those times you miss your mark. And uh, otherwise you'll repeat it. And, um, you know, you look at the best baseball players, they're hitting three or 400. That means 60% of the time they're not getting a hit, you know. Um, look at the best golf players in the world. They can go out and shoot an eight on a hole. You know, nothing's perfect. It's not handed to you. And you're going to have to deal with, um, you know, most often um, hitting below your mark. Uh, that's not to say that you lower your aim, but it is to say that, you better deal with this thing and come back better from it. You know, I, I've got a, a boy that's starting at Union College now. It's Division One hockey, and you know, there's games that he has to sit out. There's games that he plays well. There's games that he plays poorly. That's part of the struggle. And so, if you want to get somewhere, that journey is never straight. And there's yeah. plateaus where you think you're getting nowhere, but then you start to have a breakthrough. And I think that is an 
incredibly courageous thing. How many people are willing to do that? How many people look across your, um, your, your, your portfolio of buildings or within your organization say, mm, this is going to be, this is going to be painful, but we're going to have to mm -hmm. course correct a little bit here to end up where we need to be. And, you know, that you got to have an open mind for that. So we only have a couple minutes left and uh, I just want to go back a couple of questions that I'm just always interested in. I'm sure the audience is. Hockey is the only professional sport where fighting is allowed. <laughs> what are the unwritten rules and etiquette there? Um, I think if you lack courage, become a goaltender because you do not have to fight. That's right. The goaltender didn't have to fight. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a very odd thing. Um, look, this is an entertainment and probably, I think, truly, um, you know, the, 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 the powers that be in our sport look at that and say, hmm, I get rid of it. Do I lose fans? Some. I keep it. Do I, you know, lose other fans? Some. And it's just a, probably a cost-benefit analysis more than anything else. But if you watch the game evolve over years, player safety has become. It's become more, yeah. And so, but do you feel that, you know, are you a person that looks back and says, it's being evolved. Are, we, are, we, are we making it too I think safe? It's, I think it's, you have to be careful of that because, you know, the courage and the pain and the, you know, the, the, the raw physical, you know, collisions that happen out there, even in the girls' game sure. where hitting is not allowed you still have to have courage to, to go into those dirty zones, as they say, and know that you're going to get hit by a puck or another person. Um, you don't want to eliminate that because it's part of the equation of what makes somebody good. But you also don't want to just, you know, this is not not gladiators. You, you have to find some kind of balance yeah. um, on, on keeping players but, safe and kids safe. You know, they're starting out of five, six years old. But I always find it interesting because when you watch a, a hockey fight, if the fight happens, and then back to the game. You know, it's just kind of like, all right. It's like it doesn't seem like those it's grudges. A, it, I mean, or do those grudges carry carry over to the next game? That's a tough way to make a living. And these guys do. I've had people. You know, when I was at Wisconsin, I had a woman from Tennessee who was a professor, and she said, are "Those hockey fights are they real?" It's just kind of like a plan thing. And I'm like, oh, no, if you're ever down close to them, they're very, very real. It is being uh, taken out of the game for good reasons. Guys are bigger, stronger, faster now. Um, the force with which they hit each other uh, can be really dangerous. And um, that will probably, if you sat here 10 years from now, it may be a thing of the past. Right. Maybe in 10 years, it'll be like a UFC NHL uh, mix up. There. <laughs> yeah. And final years. question, your number is retired at Madison Square Garden hangs from the rafter. Does that mean you get like free tickets to all the <laughs> sports games? And if so, Roger Waters is playing in a few months. You think uh, I'm asking for a friend? I, I can uh, I can pull some <laughs> strings um, and I'll get you a good price. So, uh, uh, but no, I, I think what you've put together and, and really pleased to be able to come here live, um, it's extraordinary, particularly when you consider you know, we've just gone through this pandemic and it, you know, it was crushing on my company. It was crushing personally. Um, so many people had so much suffering to do, but it seems to me that the K through 12 and higher ed, it's, I mean, these people had to go to work as been pointed out and they're still managing to improve the facilities in a yeah. really meaningful way. So it's a awesome, awesome thing to watch. And uh, it's kind of leading the pack in a lot of places we look all over and it seems like a hell of an audience to do, um, you know, kind of, bring society where we want to go. So pleased to be here, man. Awesome. Well, uh, we're out of time. we got to get to lunch. But I know if people want to ask specific questions to Mike or even learn about his organization, you're hanging out for, for the remainder. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you.